need like one minute to start this off uh, and then I'll uh, hand over to, is it you, Christian, that starts us off or? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay, but well, that's good. Uh, so welcome everybody and welcome people connecting. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that this uh, Zoom session is being recorded, so it will be published on YouTube uh, and it's also going live on Facebook at the same time. So the world is listening in. Uh, my name is Daniel Mospe. I work as lead coordinator at the Center for Environment and uh, Development Studies, and it's a lead coordinator for outreach. So it's SEMAS, and SEMAS is a joint um, Uppsala University and the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences Center. Uh, and we've been doing uh, education and outreach activities uh, and have a research school or forum. Um, we've been doing that for almost 30 years now. Um, and it's student-led education and, uh, yeah. I'm just going to say one more thing about CMS as well. So go to our webpage. Uh, there's a ton of different outreach uh, events happening right now uh, during uh, October, November. Uh, and also, if you want a, to take a CMS course during the spring, that uh, the, the late applications open in December as well. Uh, and I'm very happy the, that you uh, contacted me, Christian, for this event. Uh, it's very much in line in what we're trying to do at SAMS and doing different events uh, with, with different focus areas and also trying to connect to the world and all the things happening in the world because Uppsala very much becomes a bubble and the university becomes a bubble within that bubble. And CMS in itself is almost like a third bubble. Uh, so, so sometimes it feels like we're we're dealing with all of these issues around sustainability and climate and justice, but, but we're also uh, far away from the world. So thank you for, for uh, bringing this to our attention and organizing this. So I'll hand over to you, Christian. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. So can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, well, um, yes, uh, Silvana and I um, are good friends, but also we, were part of the big demonstrations last year. And uh, on Sunday, we follow the uh, referendum in Chile. And we wanted to share the, well, our experience and our view on this big political event that uh, is taking place right now in Chile. So we thought that uh, first we will introduce ourselves, just to tell a little bit about uh, who we are. And then I will give uh, an overview on the demonstrations last year, but also a little bit of the background for those demonstrations and to connect with the result of the referendum last Sunday. And then uh, Silvana and I uh, want to discuss some uh, specific issues that we find highly relevant to understand this movement, but also to put the relevance of this movement in a wider context. And those issues are how issues of class and feminist movements and environmental movements are fundamental um, issues when we try to understand the movement in Chile and also when we want to see how this movement evolve into the future. So that is our proposal. It's very much a kind of conversation. So we welcome questions. And um, again, thank you very much to Daniel and Siemos for organizing this. And uh, we also hope that in the future, we can have more cooperation uh, between the university where Silvana works in Chile and where I used to work and Siemos. So, uh, I would like to, uh, Silvana to introduce herself and then I can say a little bit of myself. Uh -huh. Well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I am very excited to be part of this, um, of, you know, uh, cor coronavirus, coronavirus is uh, giving us this opportunity to be uh, around the world uh, showing what is happening in Chile. And I think, um, well, uh, our story is a story of the post-dictatorship era. Uh, I think Christiane and I are part of what children lived uh, many years ago. And I think um, 
the, 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 the times uh, we are living now are, you know, amazing for people like us who were born uh, during the dictatorship. Um, well, uh, my name is Silvana Del Valle. Uh, I am a law professor at Universidad Academia de Humanismo Cristiano. And I am a lawyer, attorney, master and doctor in law for the Washington University in St. Louis uh, School of Law. But at all, I also study at the Uni Universidad Católica at Chile, uh, which is the, you know, the, 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 the place where the Chicago boys uh, were educated and started the story of neoliberalism uh, applied as a laboratory in Chile. Um, well, my interests are the law against violence against women, and uh, I am a part of an organization, the Red Chilena Contra la Violencia hacia las Mujeres, Red Chilean Network Against Violence Against Women. And in our, um, in, in our experience, uh, which is uh, now uh, an experience of 30 years, um, we are um, uh, conscious that this uh, uprising that happened and started in last year is just, you know, the, 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 the culmination of a story um, of how dictatorship never ended actually in Chile. And well, we will explain more during uh, this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm, I am Christian. I am currently a researcher at the Department of Urban and Rural Development at uh, the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. But I moved back to Sweden in January this year. And before that, I uh, lived uh, uh, three years in Chile, which is my home country. And Silvana, I uh, worked together at the same school of law. And uh, during the demonstrations, we together many times went to demonstrate. And also we were helping uh, as lawyers, uh, those that were arrested, and uh, sometimes we visit police stations just to try to make sure that the basic human rights of the demonstrators were being um, respected. So uh, there were those uh, weeks were very intense. And uh, now I just want to give you an overview on the events of October and also tell a little bit about the, the referendum, and then we will uh, focus on uh, how the feminist movement, the environmental movement, and uh, working class movements are for us uh, essential um, movements within this uh, big uh, political uh, and massive uh, wedge of demonstrations. So I want to share um, a PowerPoint and let's see if I can also show some uh, short films that can help sometimes to um, have this overview. Can you see the, um, the PowerPoint now, I guess? Oh, yeah. yes. All right, so uh, we wanted to call this uh, activity uh, the popular uprising in Chile. First, it is popular, and that is something very important to highlight. Popular in the sense that the people went to the streets and the people demonstrated and the people for weeks kept this movement alive. And also, uh, we want to uh, discuss and share with you how we see uh, that within these people and making the people in these uh, political events, issues of class, feminism, and environmental consciousness in the struggles against inequality are fundamental ones. So the uh, picture you have here in the background uh, show uh, the first massive demonstrations in Chile. It also uh, tells us about how people went to the streets and uh, public monuments were occupied by the people. And what you can read uh, below is the word dignity or dignidad. And the word dignity articulated, articulated many of the demands and also became a word that unified the people that were part of the demonstrations. 
So last Sunday, people vote in Chile. Why they vote? When the movement was close to actually put the government in Chile in a corner where the movement couldn't be controlled, there was an agreement, uh, an agreement uh, among the political parties in Chile, the main political parties in Chile, in order to um, start a process to ask the people and define if the Chilean people wanted to have a new constitution. Why is that? Well, the constitution that we have until today was the constitution of the dictatorship. It was reformed, yes. Uh, there are some changes, yes, but it's still a constitution that ensure that the main ideological uh, principles of the dictatorship are in place and they rule in the country. So there are several examples that show that even when people want to see reforms, you cannot uh, reform uh, legal structures or institutions because the constitution stopped you or because the constitution put uh, such quorums in the parliament that is almost impossible to change either the constitution or certain uh, fundamental laws in the country. So um, there was a date for this referendum, uh, but because of Corona uh, virus, the coronavirus situation, it was postponed, but finally uh, the referendum took place on Sunday. So almost 80% of the Chilean population say, yes, we want to have a new constitution. It means that now we uh, have to write a new constitution. So the second question was, who you want to see write in this constitution? And there were two options. One that uh, say, well, 50% of the delegates to this convention will be politicians, and the others will be, let's say, regular people that will uh, present their, uh, uh, as a candidate to be delegates, right? But the other option was 100% of the convention will be um, just regular people, no politicians included there. Of course, there can be ways for people that are today politicians to uh, go for a position in the convention, but that was also the option that won. So two things. First, 80% of the people say, yes, we want to have a new constitution. We want to end this constitution. And secondly, we want that those that write the constitutions are not politicians, right? So this tells very much about how massive this movement is and also certain important political um, um, views of the people that is today really changing the country. So then you can ask what happened with those that didn't want a constitution, but well, first they were average the 20% of the Chilean population. But if you look at Santiago in this picture on the other side, you see the green areas. These are the, um, the municipalities that are among the richest municipalities in Chile, where the richest people live. And in those municipalities, the no option won. So these are people that don't want a new constitution. So they are the red. red. Yes, go ahead. In red, in red. In red, oh, in sorry. Red. Yeah. The red, the red uh, municipalities. So, well, if you are in Santiago and you travel along the city, you visit those municipalities, you will realize that it seems you are in another country, right? So you will see very wealthy families. You will see a lot of what we call development, right? So this uh, referendum also shows that those people don't want to see these changes. And here I think we have an issue of class, which is very clearly represented in these results. So when we try to understand the characteristics of these demonstrations that took place last year, first they were massive. Here we have one of the demonstrations and the biggest uh, demonstration had more than 1 million people in the streets. 
our university, the university were worse, very close to this area. So people went massively to the streets to demonstrate during those days. So now I want to show you one of the uh, events that uh, we see sometimes that show how all this started. So here I want to share a short film. Can you see some students here? So it has some music, it's in Spanish. I will just tell what the, uh, the song says. It's a pan rock, a band rock. It says, we are the sons of the workers or the proletarians. And here is where the students <laughs> So what you see in that uh, short film is uh, one of the many uh, demonstrations against the uh, increase of the subway fare. And let me just stop this one. There is. There is a music that is not uh, on purpose. I needed that to show them. All right. So, I need to get back to the presentation. Well, oh, yeah. Why, why, ah, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, days before the 18th of October, um, and because the, the government decided to increase the fare of the subway, which is a basic uh, means of transport for almost all Chilean working class people in Santiago. So the students went to demonstrate. So they went to demonstrate to the subway stations and they didn't pay, right? So, and for days they were doing this, a way to protest, but this was growing. And the government decided to use a law in order to control these students, right? So they sent basically the police forces to stop them. But that just created more anger in the people and people started to support the students. So the 18th of uh, um, October, one afternoon after let's say one week of demonstrations, so most of the subway uh, station were closed at the peak of the end of the working uh, a day. So it was uh, a Friday and then people were literally on the street without means of transport. And that started to create a new kind of step in the demonstrations because that night more people went to the street and that night everything started to change dramatically. So people started to demonstrate in the streets. The demonstrations were growing. The whole city was now being painted by people that were telling what was the main problems they saw in the Chilean system. And the word dignity started to circulate more and more as a kind of symbol of what the people were asking for. So demonstration took place mainly in one big square in the center of the capital, Santiago. And uh, this monument uh, that is actually a very controversial monument was occupied many times. Many times people stopped the police forces that wanted to stop the demonstrations. And many times this square was occupied. So the whole of Santiago was full with graffitis, uh, with 
uh, people demonstrating for weeks. So the picture we are using are pictures that, that uh, were taken by students at the university where Silvana works and others by a friend of mine and others by myself. So we were part of this, but we also wanted to document all this, but the uh, pictures show first different days and different ways of people demonstrating on the street of Santiago. So the uh, issues that the people were raising were many, but uh, you could always see how uh, labor right issues, uh, struggles against inequality, uh, gender issues, and also environmental issues as in this picture were very common uh, ways to demonstrate during these days. Mm -hmm. Police forces attack the people, so there were many violations of human rights, but people still resisted them. So you can see here how people were not afraid of facing the police forces and even the militars that went, went to the streets because at some point the government uh, passed a decree that put the militaries on the streets. So the violence of the uh, police force and the militars, the brutality was something that was not seen since the time of the dictatorship. Of course, you could see violence in Chile many times, but not at the scale that we saw during the demonstrations in October. And this is a crucial issue because the brutality of the police forces in Chile has been used against Mapuche people, about uh, demonstrators in different a protest, but here it was used against everyone. So people still went to demonstrate. People still faced them. And people also started to get together to discuss the future of these demonstrations. So um, with this picture, I want to just um, tell you that people organize assemblies People documented what were their decisions and people also wanted to move from the protests into demands, right? So in Spanish here, you can see how in one place, and then I will explain uh, more details about this meeting, uh, people were identifying the main problems. It has to do with abuse. It has to do with the pension system. It has to do with education, repression, water, the environment, health, and corruption, among others of the issues that people saw as uh, the reasons to go and demonstrate. And also people started to articulate more specific demands. So to understand this, and I think this is important um, before we continue, we have to take into account that it's not only a constitution that we inherit if you want to use that word from the dictatorship. It's a whole system very much based on inequalities. So inequalities are not an externality of the system. These are part of the system. So the system is created in order to reproduce inequalities. Because if you look at this list, you see water there. Well, water is privatized in Chile. Then you see health is privatized too. Education is privatized too. So Everything is not only a matter of being expensive, but it's also a matter of how those that can afford these basic services can get them. And the others need to fight in order to get good education or good health, if you can, right? So the level of inequalities in Chile is well documented and it was uh, something that was always contested from those that are in the mainstream. So they always wanted to say, no, Chile is making progresses. So we are moving into becoming a developed country. Chile became member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So a group of very well developed countries. So in many ways, the idea of Chile being almost a developed country was something that the ruling class in Chile always tried to impose in reality, right? So in contrast to that, people were very clear about the nature of the system, an unequal system. And this unequal system is not only something you see 
at the level of your rights. You see how the cities are organized. You see the kind of access you have to green areas, for example. You see um, this inequality in how you have to move within the city. The fact that some people travel two hours within Santiago to get to their, their workplaces, and then they travel two hours to go back home. So many of these issues are, of course, something we should understand in terms of inequality. So uh, it's the system, as many people say, and not just one government or another government. So this movement also meant a critique of the previous governments that sometimes claim not to be on the right, but uh, continue doing and uh, following the policies that we inherit from the dictatorship. Of course, they can claim they, they were reforms, something changed, but the structure of the system uh, continue being the same, an unequal society that benefits the few people. And also it is very much based on a number of economic activities that are very uh, uh, problematic in terms of environmental uh, aspect. So I will explain that later. So I just mm -hmm. um, introduced that idea now. But I wanted to also now ask Silvana, uh, what mm -hmm. can you um, add to this overall picture of the movements and also the background for that? Well, uh, yeah, um, there is a chant uh, song that people, uh, you know, um, say during these days like it's not 30 pesos it's 30 years i don't know if you have heard about this but um when people started this started following high school students who were you know uh, uh, trying not to pay the fare for the subway the the increase was 30 pesos like i don't know it's like 10 cents uh, of dollar or something it's, 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 it's a few amount it's, it's, a, it's a very low amount however uh, the country uh, most of the workers uh, they don't earn uh, the, the, the average wage in Chile so 30 pesos was like uh, a lot of money for families, 30 pesos for going to the work, for coming back to, to home. And that, uh, that increase was a high increase for people. And also it was like the, you know, the, the last uh, violation of dignity. The dignity was violated for years, for all the time, after the dictatorship 30 years, the post-dictatorship era. And I think inequality uh, is, is the world that can, you know, uh, make a, the better, the best picture of this. Inequality is the base, the core uh, of the system in Chile. Inequality in terms of economic issues and in terms of relationship issues. Our constitution actually, uh, I would say, is written by the, the gossip of Milton Friedman and the neoconservative and neoliberal uh, um, people who wrote, uh, wrote that constitution um, try to write what Friedman said about the role of the state in a country. And actually, our constitution starts with uh, in the first article with the elevation of the subsidiary state system to the most important and to the most um, privileged uh, way on how the system works i mean the system is based on neoliberal ideology and neoconservative ideologies because uh, after saying that that the, the, the state um, should work uh, in a subsidiary way. Actually, before that, it says that the family is the base of society. And the family they were thinking on when they wrote the constitution was the heteropatriarchal family, a family that is commanded by men. And they said so in the, during the time they were written the constitution. 
I mean, uh, inequality is at the core of the system in the um, uh, in how the wealth is uh, distributed um, among the population and also in how the power is distributed among the population. And the power uh, issue is something that is at the core of the patriarchy system and people actually see how these two things, capital and patriarchy are, you know, allies on domination and operation for people. So it, it, it's it, what happened in October was an accumulation of uh, violations against dignity and people saw that and start to, you know, do things against that. But of course, uh, authorities didn't see that they, or didn't want to see. And uh, one thing that also people were saying uh, on those days was, uh, we open our eyes and you are trying to close them by mutilating our eyes. Uh, one of the most outrageous violation of human rights during those days were the mutilation of eyes um, more than 400 young people uh, lost their sight, uh, one eye at least, uh, because of the, um, the shotguns. Uh, and two people were complete, completely blind. Uh, one of them was one of our students, actually, uh, in the Universidad Academia de Humanismo Cristiano, Gustavo Gatica, a young man, only 20 years old. He lost both eyes because of the chapdans. Um, and another woman, 36 years old, a uh, worker from one of the popular uh, areas in Santiago, also lost uh, uh, her sight because of the tear gas. They, they pointed at her, the police pointed at her with a tear gas uh, gun. And, uh, she lost her, her sight because of that. So two people lost completely their sight and more than 400 people lost at least one eye. And so it was, it was uh, a strategy. It, it wasn't uh, random. It was something that was directed to show people that you see what they don't want you see, uh, we will take your sight. It's awful, and um, as Christian say, during those days, at least the first month, there were so many violations of human rights that the UN uh, came to the country to, to make some observations. And actually my organization, the Red Chilena Contra la Violencia hacia las Mujeres, attended to that. And the very same day, we discovered that the police uh, were, uh, were uh, uh, spying on us spying on several uh, social organizations, including mine, uh, because we were, you know, um, fighting for justice for women uh, during all of the dictatorship era. And after that, uh, crime against women, especially femicide, are, uh, are not considered important for not the government, for the state. And that day, uh, we were uh, fighting for women who are disappeared, um, uh, particularly for Paola Alvarado, uh, who was a sexual worker uh, who is disappeared till today. Uh, she disappeared in 2018, uh, one year before the uprising. And until now, uh, the police forces are not spending money on uh, looking for her. So we were we were fighting uh, we were fighting for that kind of issues, and we were spying by the police. Um, we were that time um, demanding that not only the violation of women human rights that were committed during during that week. Uh, should be prosecuted by the international community, but also all of the things that happened in Chile after the 1988 uh, referendum, uh, which, you know, um, uh, put an end on the dictatorship, at least formally.
Well, uh, I don't know. We, we, we will talk more about this after. Yes, that is great. And, but uh, what Silvana says is very important. Um, during the, the days of the demonstrations in October, uh, many things became so clear for the people. First, mm -hmm. that, for example, the police forces were spying organizations, mm -hmm. environmental organizations were spying, yeah. feminist yeah. organizations were spying from before the demonstrations. Secondly, I think that is really important to highlight here uh, that until today, uh, those representatives of both the dictatorship, because we still have former ministers from the time of the dictatorship, and until today they are active in politics, they still say that they don't understand this. They say that why are people now trying to scrap the constitution that brought to Chile progress, development, and economic growth, right? So we say that they have not understood anything but I think that uh, we have to go beyond that. I think that they really know, but they ideologically try to still uh, keep that idea of Chile being a very successful country and now threatening the economic consequences of this. So you see the leaders of the business associations threatening consequences uh, because people are choosing the bad path, as they say sometimes, mm. that why are they destroying the basis of development in the countries, the argument they always use. But even with those threats, people still vote in an incredibly majority. Um, I think mm. we were optimists, but to think that 80% in one of the elections that is now regarded as one with the highest level of participation during recent times in Chile, so a so clear majority say that we want a new constitution. So uh, I think that uh, these are things we have to take into account when we try to understand this. Third, I think that the struggle against inequality in Chile is also something uh, from which other countries should learn. We are not just trying to understand Chile here. I think we also need to bring this discussion to countries that are seen today how inequality is growing. So um, I think that uh, what uh, the Chilean people is, is also telling to the, the, the world is that you can um, say at one point, stop with this, we want to see a change, right? So and not only to see a change that will uh, come from those on power now. So we are saying that we can create this change from the bottom up. So mm -hmm. I think that those are elements that we want to discuss later. But now I just wanted to um, elaborate a little bit on this issue of uh, how uh, working class culture and working class people in, became so important actors in these uh, demonstrations last year. So this picture is from an area um, that is famous in Chile because of working class militants. And uh, during the agenda government in the area of Maipú Cerrillos, um, many trade unions and workers occupy the factories and um, they started to produce uh, without bosses. And today there are some interesting trade unions in the area. And in this case, we have here a picture from one of the assemblies that one of these trade unions organized. So here you see uh, trade union leaders and also workers that are members of the trade unions that are um, discussing uh, both the problems and they uh, put this in, in, in this paper and also the demands, how to solve the problems. And as I said earlier, it's very clear how people understand the problems and this uh, kind of description of the problem is something you can see in many, many other assemblies that were organized during those days. So what are the demands in this case? It's more power to the people, right? New public policies that are done by the people and for the people. Also a change in the government, the constituency assembly, and also to reduce the military spending in the country. So um, 
I think that uh, what uh, is interesting uh, uh, when reading or rereading the demands, I have to say I was part of this assembly. So I am also one, one person that contributed to this, um, uh, discussing with other uh, comrades here. What is important here is that the, 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 the word, the people, and power to the people was used without apologize, without thinking, oh, this is a, a word that we cannot use, or it means something else. People understood very well what power to the people means. And also this idea of a people that was the main actor in this struggle. So I want to move now to the next. Um, well, here in the picture, you have a, um, a view on another demonstration that took place before October, and it was the climate demonstration. Remember that Chile organized the COP, uh, the Climate Change Summit, and it couldn't take place in Chile because of the demonstrations and because the government didn't want to, let's say, expose uh, the government initiative to the demonstrations of the people. Uh, but before October, there were important and massive demonstrations for climate justice in the country. So the environmental issue was part of the demonstration before the demonstration in October. And there is now some analysis of the results uh, of the uh, referendum on Sunday that shows that those areas in Chile or municipalities that are the most affected by pollution, by industrial development that don't um, see any limits in the destruction of the environment in those areas, are municipalities that vote massively to change the, the constitution. In some cases, like the first one here, Freirina, 91% of the people vote for a new constitution. And this is a place famous in Chile because people went to the street to demonstrate and uh, protest for environmental problems they face in the area. Another area here, Puchuncabi Quintero, in both areas, more than 80% of the people vote for a new constitution. So I want to show now a, a picture exactly from the area of Quintero, Puchuncabi. And this is one area that in Chile we um, uh, know as a sacrifice areas because many industries are there with a lot of pollution, serious event, people getting contaminated, um, situations that go beyond imagination uh, have uh, happened there. But uh, two years ago, uh, in a peak of contamination, people went to demonstrate massively again. And this is a picture I took when I was both demonstrating and also uh, trying to document this, where people are outside this industry demonstrating. But again, after the demonstration, people went to the municipality uh, hall to discuss what can be the alternatives. And this is what you see here. So people in the morning were demonstrating and in the afternoons, they were discussing what can be the solutions for the environmental problems they face and also the social issues that are associated always with environmental uh, problems. So this happened almost two years before October um, last year. And it again show a very uh, interesting thing. First, people demonstrate, but also people get together to discuss the future, discuss alternatives, and identify what are the problems they, they face. So in these two cases, we see how the issue uh, of a, a system that is affecting you as a worker first, and secondly, you as a worker and also as a part of an environment are things that people really want to stop. People were demonstrating before October, but in the demonstrations in Santiago and in many other parts of the country, those interests, I mean here, the, the, the workers' interests and the environmental movement interests got together in ways that I think are uh, not only important, but are crucial to understand how massive the movement was. And now I wanted to um, 
um, ask um, Silvana if she can continue telling more about how the feminist movement yeah. is part of all this. I think, yeah, thank you, Christian. Uh, well, uh, the feminist movement from the 1980s uh, immediately identified uh, in, in the constitution and in also in how the transition to democracy was working, that actually the capital and the patriarchy ideologies were uh, working against us, against women. Um, the 1980s uh, demand of democracy at the country and at the home uh, wasn't fulfilled. Uh, in the 90s, the beginning of uh, post uh, dictatorship era, during the first years, immediately the feminist movement start to demand a change, a substantial change. Because during those times, um, all of the, the, the patriarchy and capital issues that they were uh, the base of the dictatorship government uh, uh, continued uh, being applied in the law, in the public um, uh, organizations, in the public poli uh, pol political uh, uh, work, and only with a few uh, bills that were passed to, you know, be uh, presented at the OECD countries as a developed countries um, were just uh, cosmetic changes. Uh, we have in um, that, um, those times in 1991, uh, a project uh, against domestic violence. However, that project was very rapidly changed into a intrafamilial violence project. And actually in 1994, uh, it was passed uh, as an intrafamilial uh, violence bill. And that bill uh, put into the center of the debate again, the family, the family, the base of society, uh, the family as uh, the conservatives uh, were looking at it and what uh, and how it would be uh, organized uh, was the family that is protected by the law from 1994 to today. So during all of these years, the feminist movement was always claiming that the change uh, from the dictatorship to the democracy wasn't a real change. And that the femicide rate and all of the violence against women rate uh, maintenance was showing how uh, violence against women was never intended to uh, be ended up. So, uh, during all of these years, from 90s to 18th of October, uh, feminist movement was at the core of the public demonstrations. Actually, um, in, in several uh, issues uh, that the country passed during these years, uh, the feminist movement was always present. For example, uh, in 2006, when the high school students started the movement, the Pinguino movement, the Penguins movement. High school students uh, start to claim for a public uh, education uh, with equality in the in the design of the, the curriculum, but also uh, they started to claim for uh, the end of sexist education. In 2011, that demand was uh, elevated to the central demand of the um, university movement uh, against the, the neoliberal education. And all of this time, during all of this time, people uh, started to realize that all of the system, the whole system, was based uh, on the privatization of every public need. Uh, everything that you can think of uh, is privatized in Chile. Uh, it is the 
for example, the Sename, the, the organization that regulates protection for children in Chile, uh, which is in charge of foster care and all of the orphanages, is mostly privatized. Is, is held by corporations. Uh, education, all of the uh, schools, uh, most of the schools are privatized and those who are not, which are not, are uh, maintained but with a very low, um, uh, with very low money. So um, the feminist movement was aware of that uh, from the 90s to today and is uh, the, our participation, women partic women's participation in all of the movements before the, the 2019 movement uh, reveals that the issue of patriarchy, the unequal distribution of power, uh, is at the core also uh, to the to the system. The system is based on domination and oppression. Um, is based in inequality, inequality in at every aspect. So, in, in our in our case, the feminist movement was always present in all of these fights, in the environmental fight, in the indigenous fight. Always, feminist uh, movement and women's movement always were uh, saying that there is an issue with the distribution of power that is also part of the maintenance of the oppression against uh, different identities. In 2016, uh, the first public manifestations, the first public demonstrations uh, started actually with the feminist movement. In, in October 16th of 2016, uh, Latin American countries started with the Nuna Menos movement. Uh, that day in Chile, we were protesting against um, two femicides. Uh, the femicide of Lucia in Argentina, uh, which was outrageous, uh, an awful femicide, very cruel. And also the cruel femicide of a little child in Chile, Florencia, uh, in, the, in the south of the country. So that day, uh, October 16th, 2016, uh, was the beginning of massive public demonstrations in the country. Actually, there were many before that, but that day, um, at least 500,000 people uh, marched in Santiago. And it was uh, the biggest one uh, for all of the period after the dictatorship. After that, uh, 2016. In 2018, the feminist movement at uh, college and universities uh, started also to to have more massive ma more massive demonstration. Um, in 2018, there was a um, feminist movement in every university in Chile, and there was um, they, they, they were occupying the. Um, the, the places for, I think, uh, a semester. Christian, do you remember that? I think it was no, a no, whole no. semester. Uh, we lost a whole semester because the, uh, the young women were occupying the places, uh, demanding the end of sexist uh, education, the end of violence against women inside the universities, and actually the most conservative ones also uh, were part of the occupations. I remember the uh, Catholic University where I think never students occupied uh, from the dictatorship times to today. Uh, they, they had their first occupation inside the university and uh, a very classic and old uh, uh, construction uh, they they made several you know um, demonstrations around the statues of um, old priests and you know the all of the figures that they have in the front of the of the the, the central uh, the, the 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 center of their university. I mean there there are several campuses and uh, the main campus was uh, 
very Catholic uh, inspired, and they uh, the the young women um, made many demonstrations in front of it, and it was amazing. I mean, those days uh, young women were very inspired to do changes in our society. So. Obviously, during the October 2019, the feminist movement was also a, a big part of these demonstrations. And in November 25, the day against violence against women, the International Day, um, everything uh, was, <laughs> was super um, enthusiastic because the thesis, uh, la thesis, the, the, the collective group, they start with this a song uh, against uh, rape and the culture of rape. Um, everything made a lot of sense for women. Uh, there was a continuous of violence against women uh, during all the time uh, from the dictatorship to today. And for us, for Chilean women, that song represented all of the things that are wrong with our society and with our state. So the song uh, represents uh, a lot of these demands uh, and it was a very emotional moment for women uh, to participate in all of these demonstrations, even though we were under uh, emergency state. Um, in October 18th, the government, as Christian said before, uh, passed a decree uh, in which it start um, to apply uh, several restrictions to 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 the freedom um, for for being you know um, in curfew uh, all the nights to have a militarized city uh, in every in every city of the country um, even 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 with that. People uh, were fair uh, for or people were uh, um, acting and doing performances, and it, it it was beautiful, beautiful and also sad at the same time. I mean, you know, it's this combination between all of the violence you are living in your life and uh, demonstrating that you are now uh, free to demand a change. That is a combination of emotions, uh, sexual political violence during those days were part of the ways in which the state tried to repress uh, demonstrators. Um, uh, there are several, uh, you know, now, uh, um, the, uh, the, there, are, there are several now, um, people who claim that during those days they suffered uh, sexual violence directed to them to minimize their power. Um, it, it, it was amazing. There are, there, are, there are several things that happened during those days that are now part of our lives. And actually those demonstrations, the Violador en tu Camino, uh, uh, it was part of also demonstrations uh, around the world. That's why. I, I mean, what Christian said of between uh, on the connections between uh, the fight against inequality in Chile uh, and the fight against inequality in the world uh, um, demonstrates uh, that it's possible to do something uh, to as people, as regular people, to do something against that. And I think if Chile was um, uh, one of the laboratories for the neoliberal experiment, we can also uh, can be uh, a, a place that can demonstrate the world that change is possible if people organize and if people uh, retake the power. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I think that there are so many important things you say, and uh, we also want to have questions and interact with those that attended the, the presentation today. So I think we could start closing, and uh, I put here a, a collection of pictures from our friend Alexis Diaz, 
And there is something that I don't think I mentioned or highlighted enough, is that the Mapuche issue was also a very fundamental part of the demonstration. So Mapuche are our uh, originary or indigenous people in Chile. Their lands were uh, taken uh, by the Chilean state and privatized. Um, they continue fighting and several Mapuche young people have been killed by police forces during the last years. So some of the pictures you see here in the streets are pictures from those Mapuche young people. Yeah. And uh, many of the flags you saw in the demonstration are Mapuche flags. And um, I also think that uh, that is uh, partly an environmental struggle, but also it's a struggle for uh, the Mapuche people to recover their rights. And uh, the solidarity that was expressed on the street with that struggle, I think that is something really incredible because um, if you remember one of the pictures I show with when people occupy monuments, many times the flag that people brought were Mapuche flags, um, demonstrating that even when you have official monuments, we remember the history. And that is something that is so relevant here too, and it's a wider issue. Mm -hmm. But I really think, as I uh, put here, El Pueblo Unido, which is one of the main um, slogans in the agenda's government, was again retaken by the people. So the song we were singing were some from the 70s, the 70s, where people were fighting for socialism and also for the right of the people to decide how you organize society. So dignity, El Pueblo Unido, uh, the uh, memories of previous struggles and this uh, um, new struggles of the feminist movement, the environmental movement, and the new working class movements in Chile, I think that are something that will in the future also define how the new constitution is writing because it's an open uh, story. So we have the right now to define a new constitution, but we need to decide the content. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and secondly, I think that uh, uh, as, as, uh, as Silvana say, so during the last year, people not only demonstrated, they also got together to write proposals, right? Sometime when you hear, oh, they are demonstrating, they just uh, want to demonstrate, they don't know what to do. That is a lie. People knew what they, they wanted. They do know, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I think that now you can maybe close, Silvana, with some reflections, and then we can take some questions. Right, yeah. Yeah, just, just to say that, I mean, uh, we cannot see this uprising uh, uh, isolated from history. Our history demonstrates that people always were aware of what was going on in Chile with this lie uh, that politicians and economic, uh, um, economic leaders were telling us. Um, in the world, uh, when, 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 you have, when I had the opportunity to, to be in another country uh, years ago, uh, one of the things that impacted me the most was the view of Chile from the international community. Um, as Christian said at the beginning, uh, people uh, see Chile or used to see Chile as an example of democracy and economic growth. And actually it, it was all a lie. And since we lived in Chile, we were born during the dictatorship, we grew up during the post-dictatorship era. We know how education is, how health, uh, the health system is. We live uh, in a country where opportunities are very difficult to take. And I think uh, our debt, uh, our people who are now not with us, like Camilo Catrillanca or Matias Catrileo or Paola Alvarado or all of these uh, women who people don't you know, re remember, uh, people who were uh, killed by the state or with the complicity of the state, 
are part of this history too. So I think uh, if we can do something today uh, is to show the world that uh, Chile uh, uh, is not the example of democracy and economic growth that uh, our leaders uh, try to show during the 90s and 2000s, but it's a country where uh, the experiments uh, that the neoliberal um, leaders try to impose uh, will uh, start to fall apart. We, we, we can be the, the example of that, where the neoliberal um, ideology started to be applied uh, is the very same place where it will start to fall apart. And we will do that, the people. Well, uh, with that, I think um, we want to say thank you very much. And now we have time for questions. Daniel is there. And again, to say thank you to Daniel and Siemus for organizing this. Um, and now let's see if we can have an open discussion, a conversation. Yeah, and I think you can just jump in and ask a question. You don't have to raise your hand, but it also you can ask a question in the chat and I'll pick that question up uh, if you want to do it that way. Uh, so please go ahead and just jump in, unmute and jump in. Okay, if I may, I will, I will go. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for organizing this. And I want, I'm sorry I arrived a little bit late, so maybe I'm going to ask or yeah, or say some things that you already said. I am very happy to to listen to you. And I, I well, I am I am not from Chile, but I lived there for some years. So I I feel deeply how this is a, like a small victory that has caused a lot of tears and blood, unfortunately. So um, I get a lot that feeling, no, how how we can not only is good for Chile, but it's also good for all those states that where we still have the the heritage of fascist uh, fascism. No? Um, but I wanted, I am curious about how do you see like, so this is a, a very now we know it's a nice story till now, but I don't know if you already discuss what's the what are the risks you say you see. So what is the what is the power of those 30% people that didn't vote for a uh, So, and what are the risks you see in the future in what in what we need to build from now on? No? So what are the risks you see in how the process of defining the content uh, of the new constitution are? Uh, and how do you, if there are any ways to track them or to, to if there is like a discussion about how to to track this this risk so that it doesn't happen again. Thank you very much. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I am not sure if Silvana has an internet problem, but I can start. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. But, yeah. Can you start, please? Yeah, well, yeah, very good question because um, as I explained a little bit, so the fact we had a referendum was an agreement. And the agreement has some rules, right? And there is a whole discussion on the rules to define a new constitution. One of the more most problematic issues is that uh, is uh, there is a kind of quorum to get uh, decisions uh, done in the convention, right? Two thirds of the convention need to agree into a new uh, well uh, article or whatever in the constitution. So that is certainly something that can create many troubles because it can operate as a way to block other views on the convention. But at the same time, I, I think that uh, this is an evolving situation. And we know from constitutional theory that if you have a convention, the convention can decide maybe to change the rules of how it works, right? This is a political issue. Even when you try to regulate in advance, so maybe, you can see other ways to understand the rules for the convention. So that is something we have to take into consideration. Yeah. Sorry, Christian, but who, who decides who is part of the convention? There will be new elections. Ah, okay, okay. okay. You have to, uh, you have to uh, choose delegates. 
you know? So, right. of course, here there is also an issue with the, 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 pro, the whole process. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, all this comes in with the virus, with economic problems, and there are many open questions. So what I think is uh, a, a new, very important factor to consider here is the result of last uh, Sunday. It's like almost 80% against 20%, right? right. So uh, here there is another issue because the how the political parties will uh, organize you know, their list for the convention is another issue, right? Because though people don't want to have politicians there, still the parties can uh, search for people that represent their interests and they can compete to become members of the convention. So there will be a lot of political struggles. It's an open question if uh, some parties get together to have just a common list or not. There are elections in between. So I think that there are different um, processes that are mixing together. And of course, uh, we cannot take for granted what are the results of the new constitution, right? So there are, and I, I can finish with this, of course, some expectations, and then you can have also a kind of more technical discussion, because we know that uh, one thing is to establish something in a constitution, but another thing is to make sure that that right mm -hmm. will be applied in reality. So secondly, uh, as we try to say here, the structural problems with the economy in Chile are not something you just solve with a new constitution. So you really need a new uh, view on what is the kind of society you want to have. And also you have to take into account all the environmental problems you have. The overall discussion on climate change, for example, is something that people want to bring into the discussion, but uh, then how to make something very specific out of that discussion is, is a very complex issue, but I think and what really gives a lot of optimism is how people are working around this, right? How people are really thinking the future, how people are analyzing reality. And there can be differences, but I think that uh, uh, there is a very interesting process where ideas are getting together and people are more and more uh, aware of how important it is to define uh, a new model of development. Because at the end of the day, this is about development. We can discuss if, if development is the, the right concept to discuss this, right? But I think that people really want to see another way um, to get basic uh, rights, right? Health, education. And here, I think the, the environmental issues is also one top priority because it has to do with the water issue. We finish with that. So all this also comes in with the mega drought in the country. Uh, and in that context of water scarcity, people became more and more aware of the problems with the privatization of water resources in the country. So there is, I think, a very important agreement that water is a top priority. So that needs to be changed, right? So it has to do with the property rights on water. So, and here is where you see the reaction of those on power, because one of the things they really are very outspoken and say, no, you cannot change the property rights regime in this country, right? But now that is open because a constitution actually has that role. It can define property in different ways or it can even change the way we uh, claim ownership on on resources. So I think Silvana can add something to that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I think today the discussion, the, the, the public struggle is uh, how this convention will work. Uh, as you say, um, yeah, there are a lot of risks because from the very beginning in November 2019, the political forces, the traditional political forces, uh, through this agreement, try to, you know, appropriate for themselves the process. But the constitutional process, uh, many constitutional lawyers and activists uh, are saying, including us, is a process that started with the people, not, with, not in Congress. It started with popular sovereignty, 
where uh, when uh, when it, it started well several years ago when people started to do in communities some uh, cabildos as, uh, uh, we, we started to you know organize and to write what we wanted for our good life um, that started many years ago and um, about four years ago it was a little more formal when the uh, Michel Bachelet president, the president Michel Bachelet started with these uh, cabildos in, in all of the territories. Um, uh, it was more institutionalized, but uh, in the, you know, um, people in the uh, background, people who are not in, you know, in the, in the app uh, spheres, we started to write things before to write, to think, to uh, talk with our communities. So people know what uh, we need. We, we know what we need. We know what we want. And what we want, and we went it before uh, the, 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 the agreement was um, constitutional assembly, no a constitutional convention. And I think, it will depend on the people who are elected to be part of this, uh, to regulate themselves and to take the power, not from the Congress, not from the law, not from the bill, the, 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 the bill that created this possibility, but from people. They, if, they, if they take the power from the people, even our current constitution uh, doesn't say anything about uh, collective sovereignty, collective uh, pe people's sovereignty. So if, uh, if it doesn't say anything, I think, uh, and many constitutional lawyers and activists uh, think that it's possible to auto-regulate, to, to do a, um, um, a regulation for overcoming the two-thirds um, stopper and to, to work uh, with, um, with, um, uh, with more freedom. And I think it could be possible, but also I think election uh, is very important. If we, uh, if we um, achieve to elect more than two thirds uh, uh, people who can write a constitution as we want, as majority want, uh, that problem will not will be uh, no problem <laughs> and so we can do something better but you know uh, it will depend of on the work that organizations and communities do during these months uh, to educate more and more people to know how to work and also i think it's super important very important the work that people organized people can do to pressure the, the 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 convention the the assembly to do what they want in other countries uh like ecuador in 1998 that power of the people that organization achieved to to have a constitution uh, closer to uh, what they wanted uh, because they were working every day to press the convention the members of the convention to write, write what they want. Um, so yeah, it's work. There is a lot of work uh, to do, but it, 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 we are hopeful that we can do it. There is a chat question I, I can read. It. Yeah, yeah. So given the interconnecting issues and movements, environment, indigenous, new and amenos, uh -huh. governance, do you think Chile's referendum and new constitution will inspire similar social political movement and challenges to neoliberalism across Latin America? I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> because we hope so. <laughs> we hope so. I think, um, well, there are so many angles. It's a, it's a very interesting question and important. Um, uh, many angles from where you can uh, answer this. First, well, Chile was regarded as the model, right? So many things were happening in other countries, right? At different periods, but Chile was lying behind, right? So people always ask what is going on in Chile? You have a very unequal society and it seems that people accept this, right? Well, one explanation for that, I think, is that the dictatorship we had in Chile 
was incredibly uh, brutal against people, right? So there is a generational issue here too. So now they try to put the militars on the streets, but you know what happened? We went to the streets, so we faced them. In my area, for example, they came, not one or two military trucks, it was like five. They occupy our streets. And with my neighborhoods, we went down and we say, you will not stop us. So they were, you know, with the arms, but people still resisted. Of course, people uh, got injured, people was blind. So there was a brutality that you cannot imagine. But still, people uh, continue with the demonstration. So I think that is uh, a very important issue for the rest of Latin America, because people know that if you mobilize, if you get together, and if you're able to pressure the structures uh, and the political power feel like you have the power, so they have to change, right? So it's something very basic in political theoretical terms, but sometimes it doesn't happen. So it happens here. And also, why is this important for Latin America? Because this whole idea of development that Chile uh, tried to export is now uh, demonstrated as a, a kind of fake reality, right? So people are more aware of the inequalities. People know that the Chilean path to development is not something that will bring you uh, more welfare, right? So. For the Swedish context, because I always uh, like to make this argument and the Scandinavian context, if you look at what people demand, many of the things people demand are what you will think, oh, this is something we have here in this mm -hmm. country, welfare, welfare state, right? A welfare state that now is maybe different if you compare to several years ago, but it's a welfare state compared to Chile. So how people are losing welfare in some countries and on the other side of the world, the people are fighting for that kind of welfare is something important because again, it illustrates that we have to fight against inequality. So it's demonstrated inequalities just reproduce, um, well, so many <laughs> negative uh, consequences concerning to inequality. I will not repeat them. So I kind of got tempted to, to do that. So we, we know how, uh, what are the consequences of inequality, right? So in that regard, I think that, uh, yes, of course, this is important for the rest of Latin America, and we hope that the results that can be uh, in the future seen in more concrete ways are something that also help other people in other countries to imagine other path of development. There is something that um, I, I wanted to comment before I, I give the, 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 the floor to the <laughs> panel. Um, that uh, uh, it came from the, the other um, discussion. Yes, uh, this was a movement of the people, right? So we have to recognize a fact. Politicians of different parties cannot actually go to the demonstration sometimes because they are seen as politicians, right? So it can be unfair with some politicians that maybe try to do things, but I mean, it's the whole idea of having these people saying that they represent you that uh, lost legitimacy, because this is also an issue of legitimacy. And that is crucial also. So it's legitimacy now, uh, one of the issues that also is in place for discussion on the constitution. So it's legitimacy that we have to, of course, create. And it's also what can give the grounds for the changes that Silvana mentioned. So even if you say, oh, this is already decided, so you will vote in the convention this way. You cannot do that. Mm -hmm. But what happened if people say no? I mean, we are those that decided this. And also, we want to see the changes that we expected from the beginning of this process. So this is a very important political question. And as long as this is built um, in these political terms, I mean, I think that possibilities are there. So. Yeah, I, I, I want to add uh, 2090, 2020 and 2021 are uh, years of uh, acknowledgement. I think today uh, we are not as naive as we were in the 90s 
I think today we have learned from our history. Uh, Chile was an, uh, also an example to the world when we elected Salvador Allende as president. Uh, during those times, uh, many other Latin American countries uh, looked at Chile as an example of how socialism could be um, installed uh, in the country by election, by democra democratic election. But immediately, or before that actually, uh, the reaction started to organize itself. And uh, as everyone knows today, uh, the US uh, was a part of that reaction. The United States uh, started to put uh, a strategic um, people uh, in the country and uh, they participated on the coup. So today we know that. Today we are aware of that. We, today we are aware that this is dangerous for the people in power that we what we are doing now to change uh, our economic system and all of the basis for the domination and oppression that we live in Chile, the problem with uh, the First Nations, the problem with women, the problems with uh, govern governance, environment, the property of natural resources, all of these issues are uh, all under uh, the um, under the organization of the neoliberal system and if we do something to change that uh, of course there will be interest to stop us so it there is there, there are some dangers but uh, we are aware of that and that's i think an advantage we have from the past we today, uh, most of people who were voting yesterday, um, I mean, on Sunday, we were aware of that. We were, many people say we are going to vote with the eyes very open. Uh, many people said so. Um, uh, that's a difference, an important difference between the process we lived in 1988 and the process we are living today, 2020. And I think, uh, because of that, uh, I think we have hope that these changes uh, can be, you know, um, an example to other countries. I can add something to that. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, also the referendum on Sunday shows something very important, is that a lot of poor people or living in the poorest um, municipalities, mm -hmm. they vote much more than in other elections, in other, mm -hmm. because we have that issue too. In some elections, uh, rich people used to vote and some yeah. poor people didn't vote because they didn't trust the system or for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But this uh, referendum opened the possibilities for people to vote. I know many people that are politically engaged, that do yeah. a lot of activism, but never vote before. And now yeah. this time they, they went to vote, right? Right. So the, the kind of uh, correlation between you are class and uh, well your act of voting also change right right so and i think that uh, if you want to use the word politicization here i mean mm -hmm. so chile uh, was quite politicized before but now uh, there is a massive process of politicizing not only the elections but also the everyday practice of people uh -huh. right i mean uh, I can tell you that, uh, well, I live in a building, so I had a good relationship with my neighborhood. But during the demonstrations, I realized that we were all on the streets, right? So, and then you saw the guy from the other door that you used to say hello in the mornings, and then you were with that same person say, be careful, the police are coming there. So mm -hmm. call the other people, so help those, right? So there is a picture that I want to show here that I also think is so important. Um, because the brutality of the police, so many people were injured and people self-organized first aid teams, right? So you had during those days, a kind of parallel structure, right? You have the oh, teams- Can you show that photo? Yeah. I think yeah, you have the, the, the team, you have the teams of lawyers. No, there, that one, that one. This one. Yeah, yeah, this one. Mm 
Yeah. Uh, she's a student from the university, right? Yeah, yeah, Denise, yeah. Uh, yeah. She's a, one of our students and they were uh, parallel, uh, like public health uh, workers who were uh, working on the streets to help people. They, uh, as volunteers, they help others to confront the injuries. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and they still do it. Different, you know, points, and people knew that. So people uh, uh, help each other. So solidarity on the street, I think, is one of the best ways to describe this, right? Because I think that uh, people were aware that the only way to really get something was to keep the struggle, right? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, people just self-organized to do this. So it's something that's sometimes difficult to understand if you are not there, but when you are there and you, you see that you are demonstrating here and if something happened, because you have to take the risk, right? So still the friends or the people that are close to you will take you to someone that can try to help you, right? Yeah. So that is something that I think was uh, not only amazing, was key to keep the struggle. So there were informal structure, no one decide that, but you had the people that sometimes uh, move from one street to the other, so people that were waiting in the other street, so making this possible. So we have to also uh, reflect on that. It's a lot of uh, organization, but also it's a lot of kind of common ground that mm -hmm. made uh, the, uh, the, the, the movement uh, what we are talking about here today. Of course, of course, I, I mean, we are confronting fears. Uh, as you see in this photo, I love this photo because uh, you also see a man, a, dis a disabled man who is protesting <laughs> and, and he is, you know, uh, not afraid of uh, tear gas and uh, he's doing what he must do. And I think that's something that's reflecting what is happening in Chile with people we today are confronting, there is another photo with a tank. Uh, we are confronting these guys. These are, uh, these, and, and it also shows, I mean, that photo is very good too, because it also shows how um, the neoliberal state uh, works in Chile. Um, in the 80s, in the, in the middle of the dictatorship, policemen uh, didn't wear those, uh, clothes they didn't wear as militarized um, the corpse they i mean they just have you know regular uniforms and you know the sticks and the guns but today they are like in another planet <laughs> they, they they are fighting like they are in the world and mm. this is because uh privatized um the, the, the privatized uh, supplies they are uh, they, they are buying. Uh, the, the government is uh, doing um, huge contracts with private companies to buy uh, the, all of these uh, uh, guns and machinery. Um, the, there is also a show of corruption in the neoliberal state and how corporations are very interested to be uh, to keep to be keep in the in the in the contracts with the state. So it's, it's, it's also showing that violence and and the economic um, appropriation of all of our work are working together to to maintain the system as it is. I also want to say that I mean this is a picture a friend of mine took, and uh -huh. uh, I, I mean I, we we need to also. Tell, I mean, things that are hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to be here to take this picture, I mean, it's not something I would like to, you know, do uh, every day. I mean, mm -hmm. the risks that these cops will try are high, right? But I think that uh, during those days, and not only my friends, so many, many people also understood we have to document this, right? We have to also show, I mean, what is this violence, this brutality? So, and uh, again, as Silvana say, so even with that, so mm. you saw people that uh, faced them. I mean, they went and they continue demonstrating 
And I think that not only 100,000 people risked their uh, lives, I think that there were millions of people because during the demonstration, you never knew what the police and the military were uh, willing to do. I mean, following the rules of the government, right? So we have helicopters, sometimes they surrounded the squares, they, they used tear gas in a way that you cannot imagine. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in our uh, in the area where our university is, I mean, you during those days you live among tear gas, right? So weeks and weeks of tear gas. So uh, still people resisted, and still people went to demonstrate. So I mean, there are so many things we can reflect on that, but we also need to tell this. I mean, changes in the system are not going to be something easy or something that you just uh, take for granted because you demonstrate and those on power will say, okay, we understood, we will change, right? Yeah. So therefore I think that it's important to also say this is a class issue, right? Those that are uh, defending their you know, class positions will continue doing that. I mean, they voted against the new constitution, right? So. <laughs> Uh, that demonstrate that they are not willing to lose part of their privileges, right? So they are not willing to change the society that benefits them, right? So we also need to discuss in that way. And uh, this is something that also the environmental movement, the feminist movement has understood so well in Chile, right? Mm -hmm. So um, those that benefit from the system in different ways, because it's not just one way to benefit from the system, so we'll fight for what they want to preserve. And therefore, I think that this is a struggle. Yep. OK, um, should we wrap up here and, uh, and move over to this uh, non-recorded, uh, more informal mingle part of this? And I, I guess we can just keep on discussing and asking questions. Um, so, so for those of you that need to leave, uh, you're free to leave and I'll turn off the recording here. There we go. And also